Um, I've been in cybersecurity for a really long time, about 18 years. Before PGP was acquired by Symantec, I worked for PGP. When Symantec acquired them, I moved off. I've actually been in several different disciplines of cybersecurity, which is super fun because I've had the opportunity to see like cybersecurity from different views or lenses. Um, this talk came, I'll tell you the story of this talk and then we'll like jump into it. I actually don't have a whole lot of like slides with words on this talk um, because I like stories and it's much more fun to tell stories and try and get points across in stories. Uh, I work at Adobe and they came out and said, we're doing cybersecurity awareness. I said, great, I'll present. And I talked to the uh, facilitators of that and they said, okay, what about um, this topic? And I said, great, I'll prepare something for that. And like two weeks later they said, oh, never mind, we asked some of your um, team members to do that topic instead, but will you still present? And I said, sure. And I'm like, what topic? And they're like, well, I don't know. I said, you gave my topic away. And they're like, just find something. And I've been thinking about this for a while and so I'm super excited. So I thought, well, I'll just put this together and uh, let's have some fun with it. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, I've only got about five slides with um, text and then everything else is like pictures. So, But they all have a story behind them. Um, I'm a senior manager at Adobe. I've been in cybersecurity since what, the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, I started like my whole career in telecom and then went to sales engineering and then went to cybersecurity where we did encryption stuff, and then I did audits for a few years. Uh, I've managed a security operations center, which was amazing and a lot of stress. And currently I manage a security engineering team. Um, I've traveled to tons and tons of countries, right? I used to fly out. Um, <clears throat> I was in, my neighbors used to tease that they thought I was a spy. And I think my wife and my kids helped um, because they used to say, well, you know, what does your dad do? And it's like, well, he does something with computers and he flies to a lot of really weird countries. And they'd be like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, well, last week he was in Ukraine and the week before he was in like Dubai. And like he's in all these really weird, like high stress places. And so there was rumors and people are like, what do you actually do? And I'm like, well, I do cybersecurity stuff. And they're like, are you a spy? And I'm like, no, I'm not a spy. Um, but even if I was, I wouldn't tell you. So it doesn't matter. No, I'm not a spy. Um, but I am really passionate about cybersecurity. Part of, part of what I do, at least in my current role, and I like to kind of keep track of things that, that happen and where like really interesting ha things happen is sometimes on the dark net. And uh, sometimes on the dark net, what you start to look at is like they'll post things. So in October, typically at Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and I was trolling around the forums as I was putting out these slides and found this image that they had put out. And I thought, huh, this like reminds me a lot of phishing, right? Um, so they put this out and this is like the caption they said, hey, to raise awareness, we're gonna like increase our hacking for the month of October, good luck guys. Like we know Cybersecurity Awareness Month is here. And I thought, well, this is kind of fun. And it was even more fun when I looked at the, uh, the Happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And if you didn't get a C in spelling like I did, you'll notice that they did what we tell people to watch out for in phishing emails. Look for misspellings and look for like bad grammar and stuff like that. And awareness, yes, is misspelled, like if you didn't catch that, right? And so the things that we try and teach people about today in like business and teach people about in security awareness training and in other places is really valid, but it's boring. And we keep hearing the same thing over and over and over again until the, we just get numb to it. And the reason we get numb to it is like, okay, I heard it, I've been there, I've done that, right? And so a lot of times when you look at what, like they come out with, with topics, and these, this, these are the topics that they came out with for CISA this year, it's like, oh fine, right? We've all heard this before, we've all had training about this before, but so what? Like I'm probably okay, maybe, kinda. Well, well let's find out, right? Um, so the CISA topics for this year, um, you know, use strong passwords and password manager. Who has never heard that before? Like nobody, right? Turn on multi-factor authentication. Okay, yeah, what, whatever, right? Uh, recognize and report phishing, fine. I mean, the only add-on I added here is like if you get a vish or a, an, a uh, text phishing, 
you can actually forward that to 7726 on your cell phone, and that'll actually report it to your cell phone carrier. And people are like, what, that's a thing? And I'm like, okay, there's my like bonus ad in here, <laughs> right? But it works. And then the phone companies are aware that there's people trying to fish you via text. Update your software. We talked about that, like nobody updates, like it's too much of a pain. Uh, for kicks and giggles, who can tell me what CISA means, because we've talked about CISA in two talks. It's a government agency that does something crazy or weird. Yeah, that's what I thought, right? I had to look it up too. I was like, it's some government agency that does something. CISA is a cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. So bonus question. That's what it's for. That's what it stands for. I know people are like, "What?" Well, that's kind of cool. I just always call it CISA. Uh, it's been around since 2004. That's how long cybersecurity awareness has been a thing. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about passwords, um, and I know we've talked about it before, uh, but I'm going to throw out these do's and do nots, and then I've got stories, right? Uh, and the rest of this talk will be pretty much stories. Whenever possible, uh, especially for financial or sensitive sites, use multi-factor authentication. Like, I can't stress that enough. I'll talk about that in a second. Like, change your default credentials and passwords. We'll look at that later, too. Use passwords or complex pa or passphrases or complex passwords. It sucks because if you actually sat down and said, what are all the sites and, like, applications and stuff I need passwords for, there's, like, a couple hundred and nobody can remember that many. Um, if you think about why telephone numbers were like 10 digits, is because most people can remember seven and then the area code's just kind of an add-on, right? We, we can't remember that many different things, which is why we see people reuse passwords and why we see people like the same password across multiple applications. Uh, it's just dumb to say, I'm gonna use the same password for my bank as I use for Facebook. Like you're, um, I'm sorry, you're an idiot if you do it, but I'll talk about that, so. Uh, rotate all passwords periodically. I hate this like advice to myself, um, and so, which means you guys are like, oh, I've got 300 passwords, I should do it, but I'll talk, you know, we'll touch on that. Um, don't use the same password for multiple applications and services, which means we're probably always gonna be using some type of password manager. Uh, passwords and spreadsheets are kind of crappy, but they're better than like the same password. I mean, they're crappy because there's so many compromises your computer and now they've got all your passwords. Um, don't click on phishing emails. Like anytime you get something that says, hey, your bank has like a really important message for you, just go log into the bank. Don't click on the email because all banks and all financial institutions and other places have a message center. And if they really did send you a message, they can, they'll actually get through that, right? Funny story, okay, I don't think it's funny. My wife doesn't either, but I do. <clears throat> um, she called me one day, it was a couple years ago about this time of year, and she said, hey, so I got this email from Amazon, like, did you order something? I said, well, no, I didn't order anything, like you're in charge of Christmas, right? Uh, and she goes, well, I got this email that said your shipment's delayed, and I didn't know what it was because I didn't think I ordered anything, so I like, clicked on the link, and then I entered my password, and I was like, and I said, Ann? And she goes, well, it logged me into Amazon, nothing was there, and so I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I said, well, congratulations, dear, you just got fished, right? You just lost your credentials, hold on a second. So on the phone, I, I logged into Amazon and changed the, the password, but it's that easy for us to get fished, right? Especially this time of year. I don't know how many, like I could probably pull up in my email today and say, I don't know how many like, hey, there's this document or contract you need to sign or validate, and it looks like a valued DocuSign um, like link or it looks like a valid something. Um, the problem with that is, is I just don't trust anything. And so my accountant called the other day and said, look, I sent you these documents. And I'm like, well, you didn't tell me you sent me the documents. They're like, well, you should have received something from DocuSign. I was like, do you think I'm going to click on that stuff unless I know it's coming? The answer is no. So thanks for calling. I'll go find it and click on it, right? So it really irritates like people who try and send me stuff when they don't tell me they're sending it to me because I just ignore them. Because there's, it's way too easy to lose our credentials and it's way too easy to get fished. Um, and then don't use default credentials. We'll talk about that. You can give some tools out. This will actually build on some things we'll look at in a little bit. Um, have I been pwned if you guys have ever played with it? It's super fun. Um, I can put in all my different like Hotmail, Gmail, if you're really old, AOL email addresses, 
and I can go say, hey, have you been involved in a breach, right? Um, and it'll go through and say, of all, the, it collects databases of breaches or dumps of databases that have been involved in breaches, and then it'll go through and like articulate those to say, has your email be, been involved in a breach? If your email's been involved in a breach, this is one of mine, then you can say, oh, what breach was it involved in? And then that kind of tells me what I should do as far as where should I change my password, right? And that goes back into if, you, if your information has been lost in a breach, right? Equifax got compromised a few years ago. If you had an account with Equifax, which you probably do, um, go change that password. If that particular password was used anywhere else, guess what? You should probably go change that password in all the different places it was used. When I started looking at this, I thought, okay, the ledger thing I can understand. I don't know what online spam bot is, and I don't know what verification IO is. I think it's for payment something, and I don't know what some of these other things are. In other words, our information is being sold all over the place, and so there may be breaches that happen out there that we are exposed to that our information or our passwords are in that we have no idea our credentials have been lost, right? Which goes back to like the recommendation of just change all of your credentials periodically. A couple of years ago, I was, we were doing a response exercise. We had a, a, uh, an environment that we were investigating that had been compromised. And as we were looking through the logs of the compromised environment, it was a web application, and we saw that three of the admin accounts of the web application got compromised. And then we started looking and saying, okay, so how did these three get compromised? And really what it was is we saw five accounts of this web application of the admins that were targeted. We don't know how those emails got out. And we saw that two of those accounts were not compromised, but we saw brute force attempts on them. And then the other three accounts did get compromised and, and so with the same tactic. It was a brute force attempt, right? They tried hundreds of different passwords with a valid email address and finally found some that worked. And we're like, so then we started investigating and saying, well, why did these three get compromised and those two not? And the only reason we could come up with is the two that did not got, get compromised actually changed their passwords within the previous three months. And the other three accounts had passwords that were over a year old. And I was like, huh, that's actually kind of cool, right? Uh, and so that's why I, Again, the recommendation, go through and change your passwords on a regular basis. Now let's talk about using the same password. Uh, I was in an engagement a couple of years ago, and it was an executive of this company, and he's like, you know, I don't think you can, like, compromise me. And I think I'm pretty secure, and, like, my footprint is, like, really secure. And I said, that's great. And so we engaged in the engagement, and then, um, like, this is so cringeworthy. We got access to his guest network on his... Um, in his company, and then we had found out that he had accidentally shared his hard drive out to like everybody on the network, right? Which is like fantastic for me and terrible for him um, in so many different ways. And so it was about lunchtime, and so I thought, well, I just grabbed an empty removable drive. I set it to download the contents of his hard drive and went to lunch and came back. And you know, by then he had gone home or he had done something. And I, I thought, well, I wonder what he has. And so I started going through, and I had his desktops and his documents and his email folders and his downloads folder. And I thought, with those three things, I can probably find a bunch of really juicy things. And I did, right? I found his like Excel document that said password, which was fantastic for me. Um, and I found out that he really liked the Braves. And I found out that like his graduating year was like you know 86 or something like that because all of his passwords were some type of combination of Braves 86, Braves 1986, capital Braves 80, 1986, Braves exclamation mark 1986. And I was like, great. And so then I had kind of everything. And then he also had a list of where those passwords were used. And so part of that was like, I wonder what I could actually get access to, right? And so then I started saying, well, I wonder where I can get in just with these passwords and which ones will challenge me with um, challenges that I like security questions and stuff like that. So I started with like his social media accounts and was able to get into um, his Google account, but not Facebook, for example. And I was able to get into his um, 
Amazon shopping account, and then I thought, well, his bank account's here. I, didn't, I got into one bank account, but not the other because of the challenges. Um, and then I, I was like, hey, you're like, your online trading accounts here for retirement, and I was able to get in there, right? And then I like screenshotted like his $250,000 portfolio, and then when I presented it to him, he's like, you're a jerk, right? And I was like, I'm so sorry, better me than somebody else, this is what you did, and kind of walked him through what he needed to do to fix it, right? And after that is when I was like, okay, anytime I get the option, doesn't matter if it's Gmail, or my bank or anything like that. I'm gonna PayPal, right? Um, I'm gonna use multi-factor authentication because I don't know if my password's gonna get compromised somewhere like this and then it's gonna be um, like used to like, I'd, I would be really, really mad if I lost all my money. I'm kind of irritated when like my credit card's compromised. I'd be even more mad if like my bank accounts are like, I couldn't pay rent and stuff, so. Breaches happen all the time, so much so that we're pretty immune to it, we're pretty numb to it. Um, you know, things you can do, freeze your credit, check your email addresses, like using I, have I been pwned for signs of compromise, um, and some other things as well. We'll take a look at social media in a bit. Let's talk about software. I love software. I also love free software. Um, I hate paying for software, uh, but free is not always free. Um, as I've gone through when I was a college student, like when I first started my career, if I could find like a cracked piece of software, I was pretty happy. Um, and we see that happen a lot. Um, I need to do this, I need to do this action, I'm gonna go find cracked software, I should be able to download it, it should be safe, right? Sure, it might be, uh, but free isn't always free. So I wanna talk about a couple of investigations we did probably in the last two or three years that can demonstrate that. I was, we were investigating a compromise where a user had lost his passwords and they had lost a whole bunch of other stuff. And he's like, yeah, I needed this piece of, it wasn't even software for business. He's like, I, I game a lot. And I found this like plugin, it was for Counter-Strike, I think is what this one was. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and download this like add-on for Counter-Strike. Um, and so he downloaded it and kind of ran it. So we ran it in the test environment and this is kind of what we got. And then um, he executed it. He's like, it works fine. Like, my game's not broken or anything. But that's all he saw. And I was like, OK, so let's go forensic. Let's actually go see what happened with this piece of software for this plugin that you added. What really happened was the game did work great. Like, it didn't do anything. But what it did in the back, um, background is actually add a bunch of like really cool, like gotchas, like surprises, bugs, not bugs, but little uh, nasty surprises. What this software actually does is it installs the add-on perfectly so your game can function, you can have like the overhead displays and stuff. But in the background, because it's free, it also goes into all your browser caches, like your Chrome and um, Edge and stuff like that. And it grabs anything like that's saved as far as cookies and passwords and credit cards and stuff like that. And it sent it out to a C2 server. And so we saw the C2 server is like somewhere in Russia. And then it would take the, anything that had a credit card, it would send out to a different C2 server, right? That could be used in like a credit card breach. I was like, ooh, that's not bad, right? In fact, that's so not good, but you don't really realize it, and it's like really not sexy to see, so we're gonna do other stuff, right? Um, worst case scenario, like you could end up with a thing like this, you like your computer automatically reboots, you end up with this um, message that says, hey, your files are encrypted and currently unavailable. You can check it, you know, congratulations, uh, but if you want them back, go ahead and pay me you know, $1,000 in Monero or $1,000 in Bitcoin, and guess what, you just got ransomware, um, which is bad. The problem with ransomware is that you usually don't um, get your files back or it's, you know, you never have that guarantee. So you may be out your files plus your 1,000 bucks if you decide to play the, pay the ransom. And we've seen that happen all over the news these days, right? Um, there's uh, some new things that have come out like in the last couple weeks where they're actually running like full infrastructure ransomware as a service, just like normal companies do. They've got customer service lines. They've got like, hey, we'll like negotiators that will negotiate ransoms. They've got like people who will do access 
management, so they'll go get access to environments and systems. Then they've got like not just the access, but then they also have like the um, installers of the ransomware and then the maintainers of the ransomware. So these are just like, they're run like normal businesses, right? But they make money by stealing other people's data. They recently changed to say, we're not just gonna ransom you and like try and get money out of you, but we're also gonna like ransom your customers on the back end saying, hey, I've got all this customer data. We're gonna post it um, on the internet unless you also pay us a ransom. And now they'll report. <laughs> and now they'll report to the SEC. That was so classic, right? I'm gonna be a hacker group. I'm gonna go ahead and report to the SEC because you refused to pay the ransom. So that the SEC will come investigate you and cause you a whole lot of pain is really what that was. So well played for them. Um, as far as, <laughs> yes, so, terrible, terrible. So this is boring to watch, um, and so because we've all heard this before, I just wanted to take and like throw on a different spin of like what happens when we use untrusted software. And so the best way I can demonstrate this in, a, in here is I started playing with Shodan, and so let's play with video cameras, right? Um, why not? So I was uh, on Shodan. You can see that there's video playing here. Uh, and I was able to go out and find like these cameras that you can just buy out of the store. And I, was, and I actually owned some of these cameras. And I was like, wait a minute. Like out of the box, these are pretty secure. Well, they're typically cameras that you set up in your home. If I'm on my home network, I can log in. I can see what's going on like in my alleyway or my backyard and stuff. But really, what's really going on here? Um, and what I found was People wanted to take these cameras so they didn't have to pay the fee for Ring or have to pay the fee for um, whatever security companies are out there. And they wanted to say, I'm going to set this up at home. And so somebody's developed this software that they're saying, hey, you can remotely access your cameras on the internet. All you have to download is this package, install it, and then from your cell phone, all you have to do is like get this information, we'll show you how to get. And then if you're out for dinner, or if you're like have a rental unit like this, or you want to see what like deer are running through your backyard or elk, right? All you have to do is log in or click the button and log in, and you can see this, which is great. Um, except for whoever created the software, I don't think gave any type of security consideration to it, because what they accidentally did is did something like this: is like these managers or these small store owners decided that hey, I don't want to just look at like what's outside my house. Maybe I'll put this camera that's in my um, store, right? So I can see what's going on in the store. The problem here is that anybody that's connected to the internet, so anybody in the world can actually go through and say, okay, um, as long as I have the IP address and I know how to do it, like I can go ahead and log in and see what's going on in the store, right? It's fine until you decide to put the camera right behind the register and now I can like turn on the video, and now when they log in, I can say, okay, let me just go ahead and grab the password, right? Or let me go ahead and grab the credit card like transaction, or let me go ahead and grab other things that are in here. And I thought, okay, well, that's like a little creepy um, and stuff, but hey, like, could it get worse? Well, yeah, where else do you put cameras? Well, I, I just heard someone like gasp. Yes, you are correct. Um, you are absolutely correct, right? But maybe, um, hey, I'm a grandson, or I have some technical ability, and I want to make sure Grandpa's still alive, right? And so what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and set up a camera in the living room, because that's a good idea, and then download this software that's completely not secure, and then I can log in and check on Grandpa whenever I want to. I don't actually know whose Grandpa's that is, but I can check on him. Like, if you guys want the IP address, you can too. Right? Or maybe I'll decide to set this up in my kids' room, right? Because that's not creepy at all to know that anybody on the internet who actually stumbles across my IP address can log in and see what my kids are doing. Yeah, terrifying. I found some other stuff that wasn't like conference worthy, um, but there was some crazy stuff I saw. I was able to log in and watch like people out on the backyard, like porches smoking. I was able to log in and see people in their garage. Um, I'm able to log in, like if I'm like he's in a neighborhood, and I can say, well, I can log into all these cameras, and I can see when the cars are there and when the cars are not there. So if I'm a burglar 
or I want to do some type of harm, I know when people are or are not home, right? If I can log, I watch some lady and son have an argument in their living room one day. Um, I thought that was kind of funny. I thought, well, this feels like weird, so I logged out. I don't know what the argument was about, but they were watching Gladiator on the TV. So, <clears throat> so if we if we actually take and so we think normally like we're secure and we'll download the software and we'll trust it, but sometimes we actually do things that actually expose us to um, in inadvertent ways to make us not secure. And that's kind of what I wanted to point out here. Just because I download an add-in or a patch and I haven't paid for it, or if I don't know what software does, what I can actually do is say, instead of being able to just keep track of my kids to make sure my family and my home is safe, what I accidentally did here is said, hey, anybody, anybody on the internet can actually intrude into my personal life or log in and see what's going on in my house as well. And as a dad, I am not comfortable with the thought of people being able to log in and watch my kids, right? Um, as, uh, but I want to be able to. So it's making sure that we set things up actually in a secure manner. So I'm going to switch gears because that was creepy enough um, to what uh, remote access, right? We've heard about remote access, how you can actually compromise systems and stuff like that. We actually went out and we um, decided to like go through and see what we could find on Shodan for remote access. We ran across a whole bunch of computers that like showed screens. So this is me. Somebody has VNC, which is a remote access software. Um, as you see, what I was able to do is just say, here's the IP address of this computer. Go ahead and let me in. What did we not see here? We didn't see a password prompt, right? In other words, people have actually opened up their computers to the internet for either remote desktop access, or they've opened up their computers to say, I want it be, to be really easy to log in. Now, I don't read Chinese, but my kids do. And they said this is either a business site or an educational site. They weren't quite sure, and I didn't really want to poke around, which means I can be here in Utah, and it doesn't matter where you're at in the world, um, you can access like computers that have been left open, right? Um, so oftentimes, we'll, for convenience or because we want things to be easy, we may inadvertently expose ourselves to things that just require no authentication whatsoever. The way we've seen these used is great um, if you want to do malicious things or you want to hide your tracks, right? We've seen the movies where people like pop all over the world and you know bounce off of connections and like, hey, how did I access this? If I wanted to hide where I was coming from and do you know some type of bad activity where I didn't want to get caught, I might look for these servers or these computers on the internet, log into them with no password, go through and erase the log so it doesn't show on there, and then I'll hack from that computer. So if the FBI or somebody chases it back, they're chasing it back to some little poor mom and pop or some little education institute, and they actually don't know who I am, right? All they're going to see is like some type of erasure of logs for a period of time knowing when I was there. Um, OK. So that's fine. Maybe I just, I'll just i make sure I have passwords here, right? Um, and, but it's hard to remember passwords. And so I, I want to feel like I'm secure, but I'm really not. So I'll just use a default password. Maybe it's my router at home, or maybe it's my video camera uh, at home. And what I'm going to do is I'll just set up the camera. It's got a password, so nobody's going to get into it, right? And I don't want to have to remember it. So admin admin should work, or admin admin should not work, right? So this is a factory in um, Vietnam, I think, uh, I found that had a camera set up, so I knew it was a camera. Um, in the header of when I um, scanned, I was able to see kind of what the manufacturer of the camera was. And I was like, huh, I wonder what that default password is, a little Google. OK, it was like, what's the default credentials of this Canyon manufacturer? And then I didn't even have to click into the link. It said the default credentials are admin admin. And I was like, great. Let me try and connect to this site via admin admin, and now I can watch the factory workers work, right? Um, and stuff like that. So, um, but that's, you know, I showed you a Chinese and I showed you a Vietnam. That's great. Let's see if we can show you something a little closer to home. Uh, does anybody live or know anybody in Atlanta? Atlanta, Georgia? Nobody? That's fine. If you're on the corner of Valley and Creekside, I can give you a morning traffic report. Right? So this wasn't set up by an individual. This is definitely on top of a traffic pole. 
uh, definitely using the admin admin as the default credentials as you go through and uh, like set it up. So just because you have default credentials, don't think you're safe. And just because you're like, well, nobody's gonna know it's this type of camera, or nobody get, is gonna know it's this type of system, obviously that's wrong, right? Um, it's pretty easy for us to try and determine what systems there are. Uh, one of the defaults I always check is admin admin because it's surprising how many people still use it um, as far as that goes. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're outside the country or inside the country. You know, you gotta be careful with that. If there's security guidance in, as you set up your modems and your routers and your computers and your home labs, don't use default credentials, right? Don't use like the top 100. Yeah, you've got a question, so. Uh, Yeah, so it can be beneficial, right? Here's some other screenshots you showed, Dan. I pull these up for the next demonstration. There's kind of three things we need to be able to hack into a system, right? It's nice to be able to say, okay, I've got a username. I need to find a username or at least guess a username. I can usually guess admin and stuff like that, or I can guess other things. Uh, I need passwords and I need the IP address, right? Well, it's pretty easy to find the IP address. You can use Shodan or you can, people map the internet, they scan the whole internet looking for remote access. But if I can actually remote into a remote desktop and I can see a screen like this that has everybody's names in, now I know what usernames to attempt, right? So what am I, ma what am I missing in this triad? Well, we're missing passwords. Well, we just talked about have I been pwned and there's all these password breaches out there. What's gonna prevent me from going out and grabbing all these password dumps, because I can usually find them, and saying, hey, are there any um, of these usernames and do they have passwords? And then can I go through and say, here's the password I found maybe on Facebook or Equifax or somewhere like that. And then maybe I'll enumerate different variations of that password because probably they've used the same thing if they're not very clever or they've used the same one. Or I can just feed it like a whole, what's called a rainbow table, a whole like database full of passwords to see if I can get in. And that's kind of what we did here, right? So. What we did here is we actually went and, uh, this is an older one, but we went and like did a bunch of scans. We found a network that we could scan. I actually did this for a conference. Okay, so I'm gonna set this up and I'm gonna talk through it, sorry. Um, I was at a conference um, in California with a bunch of business executives and they had the Wi-Fi open. And so I was getting ready for my conference talk and I thought, well, I can talk and like really, you know, be boring like everybody else. Um, or we can do something fun. So I had about an hour before the conference, so I scanned the whole conference network that they had all the people join. And then what happened was I found a whole bunch of computers that had remote desktop enabled that were on the conference network. And I thought, well, this is great. And so then I went through and started looking to find usernames. And then I started, found a bunch of usernames. And then I was like, well, let me just grab like the thousand most common like admin passwords that are out there. And so then I grabbed the thousand most common passwords that were out there and then recorded this as I put this together. So I was getting up talking about like security and stuff like that to all these executives at this conference. And then I went through and kind of played this video and it says, so I apologize to whoever's laptop um, like rebooted or like logged them out but thank you very much for giving me access to your system and somebody was not happy, right? Um, but it made the point that we were trying to make, that you have to do things that are like in a secure manner. And it was fun. Well, for me it was fun. And I said, whoever this is, like come talk to me after and I'll talk to you about it. And so they came and talked to me after and I talked to him about it. And then we kind of walked through, like he had a remote access enabled here's what we were able to do because you're on an uh, insecure network, and then here's what you can do in the future. And they're like, dude, you need to come to my business and uh, like tell us how to do this better, right? Okay, so that's enough about remote access, default passwords and stuff like that. Let's chat social, right? So we all talk about how we can like be exposed socially. We can accidentally expose stuff um, that we don't mean to expose. Uh, be careful about what you post. Uh, be intentional about the information you share, and then help friends and family be security aware. Why do I say help friends and family be security aware? It's because it's amazing how many friends and family post stuff 
on my social, that gets tagged on my social media feed that I really don't want out there. Oh, your son's turning eight today. Happy birthday to him. And I'm like, please. Now you know my son's name, his date of birth, and that he's eight. You know, happy anniversary, you know, things like that. And so the problem with social media or the challenge is, is that once it's out there, like it's out there, and there's things that we expose about ourselves that we can like clue together. I may not know who Zodiac is, right? Man, I'm gonna pick on you. Uh, and I may say, man, I've heard about this hacker handle called Zodiac, I don't know what it is. But I can Google Zodiac with in conjunction with Saint Con, and I can Google Zodiac with conjunction with like B-sides, and now I've got a name to match to a handle, right? And it's that easy. And so I wanna kinda walk through kind of things that you should be aware of. And it's not just like people, it's not just what people post, but it also can include pictures that you post as well. So we're gonna go through two more demonstrations with that, and then we'll open it up for questions and answer. So it. It's spoiler. Uh, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do it a little different, so it should be fun. Um, so enjoy this video, I found it, this person is great. I was planning on setting something up, but she does it much better than I could, and she's much more dynamic. Cat named Garbage says, find my birthday. Oh, you're making an office reference in your username, Millennial Alert. Okay, if we start on your TikTok profile, it says Haley at the top, and you have two videos. They are not helpful at all, really. So I went to your followers, and oh boy, let's talk about your first one. On the top of her profile, there's no indication on what her name is. In one of her TikToks, she's talking about how she got sick, she went to the hospital, and her bill was crazy. Someone was like, uh, I don't believe you. So what did she do? She showed the entire hospital bill and did not censor out her full name. So I looked her up on LinkedIn and she works for a dental billing company in Texas. And the second thing that helped me was the way that you said something on her TikTok. Hey, a friend posted a video about how she always talks to this rep on the phone at work who has roosters crowing in the background. You commented on that video and you said, I haven't heard from rooster lady in a while. How was she doing? If the rooster lady story was just something you had heard from your friend. You would have said, I haven't heard about rooster lady but you didn't. You said, I haven't heard from. That tells me you've also interacted with Rooster Lady, which means you work with this friend. Because I already knew where your friend worked from LinkedIn, I looked that company up on Instagram, hoping that someone named Haley followed them. Someone does, and they have your same profile picture as TikTok, Haley. The profile is private, but it does say a full name, and last name starts with D. I Googled this username, and I found some stuff. First thing I found was you asking someone to talk more about Birkenstocks on TikTok, which means your old username you to be here is Haley, but you changed it to a cat named Garvin. So I love a good comfy Burke. Second thing that came up on Google was you tagged in this photo at a dental place. It's not the dental billing place that your friend works at, but guess what? Your friend is in the photo. Someone in the comments said, I love our accounts team. My guess is that you used to work with your first TikTok follower at this dental place, but you still know about Rooster Lady because dental billing places would interact with the same reps, right? I digress, we're looking for your birthday, but also I got Invisalign like five years ago. Do my teeth look nice, Haley? I'm scrolling on that dental place's Instagram and it's a good thing they love you because they did a whole post about you. You said you're the account supervisor, you live in Texas, and oh my God, you play the violin, cool. But the post wasn't even the most helpful thing for me. It was the comment. Someone said, love Haley B. And I said, wait, your Instagram says Haley D. I think Haley B is your maiden name and Haley D is your married name. So I knew if I went to Facebook, I was looking for a Haley D or a Haley B. But lucky for me, there was one more result on Google when I looked up your username here is Haley. This post of your friend getting married and you commented, happy anniversary, baby. And this friend has a lot of posts with you in it. She calls you her best friend a couple times and you're in her bachelorette party photo right there in the middle and oh, she do be loving the Birkenstock. Your friend also has her full name on Instagram and it's pretty unique. So to Facebook we go and remember, we're looking for a Haley D or a Haley B. And this post came up on your friend's Facebook with a Haley Marie B in the caption, but it's not blue, which means you deleted your account. Because your profile was deactivated, I looked up Haley Marie B on Facebook and went to photo, hoping that someone said your name in a caption. And they did. There's a photo that says, congratulations, Haley Marie B in the caption. You're a violin. That's you. And then I clicked who liked that photo to see if anybody had your same last name. And one man did. And I looked up Haley on his profile. And this post came up that says, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my grandbaby. My grandma and grandpa talk like that, so I assume every grandparent does. And someone else with your same last name commented on this and said, so very true. Haley Marie B knows this. She has her granny wrapped around her finger. Went on her profile and I looked up Haley. Nothing. I looked up birthday. Nothing. 
But guess what, everybody? That doesn't mean that it's not on their profile. Facebook search sucks. And for some reason, you will get more results if you filter your search by year. I looked up the name Haley on her profile and started searching in 2014 only, in 2015 only. And on April 21st, 2020, your grandma wished you a happy 25th birthday. Happy birthday, April 21st, 1995, Haley Marie B. If you had any doubt that I wouldn't find your birthday, let me just play you a song on the world's tiniest violin. <laughs> Bye. I thought this did a great job of being able to tie information together to say, how can I find out as much information as I can about people? I had somebody at my work say, you know, that's like, that's TikTok or that's Instagram. That's like not really real. I said, if you're okay, I'll do it to you, right? And so she's like, fine. She's a person running our cybersecurity awareness program. Cat named Garbage. Oops. Cat named Garbage. And uh, so I took kind of a couple hours and went through. And by the time I was done, I said, here's your name. Here's your maiden name. Here's your, where you went to high school. Here's who you graduated. I said, you've got a cat or dog. Because I found out that she had made a donation to like an animal shelter. She goes, oh my gosh. That, like, that's when I had my cat spayed or neutered or whatever. And they have to public, like they have to publicize those like publicly of all donations, right? And then I found out she bought a house because her real estate agent was super nice and like did this whole profile and like, posted something on Facebook. So it wasn't her that posted it. And then I found like the small town she lived in and they put a newspaper article out, kind of like St. George, right? That said, hey, like this person bought this house and here's how much they paid for it. And they're proud new owners. And I said, so now I know how much you paid for your house, where your address is, where you live. I know that you love pets and I know what you graduated, I know you did a fun run at this company, and then based on what I found on LinkedIn, like I gave her all this information, she goes, that is like absolutely terrifying, right? Like the, and she goes, but I try and be like secure in my online profile, I try and be, you know, do what I can to make sure that I'm not exposing stuff, and I said, it's not necessarily you, you did pretty good, it's everybody around you that decided to post stuff that included information about you, right? And, and that's part of the problem we run into now with social media, because I get tagged in photos, and I'm like, why did you tag me in that photo? And they're like, well, I found this, and I thought it would be cool, like family photo or something, right? And I'm like, it's not cool if I want to have a clean online presence, but we can't stop it, and once it's out there, we can't get rid of it, right? So it goes back to, like, way at the beginning of the talk, where I talked about do stuff like freeze your credit and, like, check your passwords. Well, let's take a look at Google Photos. Um, so I talked about it. I wanted to do this different. I thought, well, it would be fun. Um, there's been things that have gone around the news where, and recent articles where uh, people or companies have been hiring. And what's happened, um, and this is the reason for this next demonstration, what's happened was uh, people are hiring. And what they'll do is find these resumes online. And then they'll actually go through and like interview the person. And then what ends up happening is that somebody like in India or in Vietnam or somewhere and you'll end up with these fake profiles, and they'll put somebody who's really knowledgeable about the subject that comes in and gets interviews and gets, gets these jobs. And they're totally like ghost positions and stuff like that so that you can get insider threat and stuff going. Um, I heard about a story of a cybersecurity engineer who got this text from his friend, and he said, hey, I just interviewed somebody, and they had your, look like your resume with your picture on it. And he goes, but you're not out looking for a job. He goes, no, I still work at the company I'm at. I'm super happy. And so he shared, and sure enough, like somebody had taken or scraped his information from Facebook or from LinkedIn, created this job post that mirrored it, applied for these jobs, and actually had somebody stand in for the interview to get the job, right? And then they get hired and get all the access, and now you have this great like insider threat thing going. And I thought, well, I wonder. So that sounds like we can do it. With Google Photo, I can like go and look for stuff. But I wonder how far I can take this. And that's what kind of the Cat next, garbage says. Oops, uh, demonstration talks about. So I thought, well, I wonder if I could do something like if I'm recorded here, somebody could actually take a screenshot of me and then be able to find information about me. And I didn't know if it would work, but obviously it did because um, I've got the demo, right? So I found this like ad video online where uh, it's a Photoshop one because I work for Adobe. And really what I did was I said, okay, this video is playing. It talks about how you can use this product or software to like put head on a bald person, I think is what it was, right? 
All I really wanted was this. And so what I did was I stopped the video and I took a screenshot of it. So there's the screenshot that I took. And I thought, well, I wonder what I can find based on a screenshot out of a video based on this person. Seems interesting, right? So I did. So I went to Google and I popped it into like Google Photos. And I said, OK, here's the photo I took from the screenshot, right? And I want you to go tell me where this is. And sure enough, it's like an actor. And I started to see like all these places where he pulled up, um, which I thought was super kind of cool. And I said, huh, well, let me go see kind of where he shows up. And so as I go through the rest of this video, we actually talk through how we can, like he shows up in like an Amazon ad, and he shows up in like a university, and he shows up in like a training seminar, and you want like professional services, here's like your guy, and he shows up here, you know? So here's the Amazon ad, you can be the best dad ever, thanks Photoshop, we love our products, right? Because we can put a coffee mug in his hand. Um, but you can also find like, hey, here's a sale where he's like, there's the men's collection, there he is again, right? But I didn't do it with just this. I'll let this keep playing. But I thought, I wonder what else I could do with it. Because when I looked at the previous video, or one of the previous videos um, that I thought about using, uh, they were able to associate somebody with a dog, right? And so I started looking at things that could be pulled out based on appearances of people. So if you can find somebody who has like the same ring, you can actually isolate the ring and go search for the ring and see if you can find the ring in photos. And it'll find things like rings, or it'll find things like necklaces, or it'll find things like if you've got a favorite ball cap and stuff like that. You can actually isolate and look for things that are not just the person or the face, but you can search for people's pets, or you can search for people's cabinets or anything else that could be part of a photo, right? Um, so crazy stuff that we can do online. Again, not a bad idea to take your photo. If you've got a LinkedIn photo or if you've got a Facebook photo, go take and throw it into Google Photos and search it and see if you've showed up somewhere that you weren't expecting to be show up. It's one, it'll keep you up super late at night because it's super fun and interesting. And two, it'll let you know if like somebody's actually taken and trying to impersonate you or at least your profile in some ways that you can then reach out to LinkedIn and say, hey, that's, that's false. Like, please go ahead and tear that down. So I hope this was fun. I thought it was fun. Uh, we're about out of time. We've got about four minutes. I'm going to just pause here and answer any questions you guys have. None. OK. So that's a great question, because if you start talking about like password managers and stuff like that, like I hate to say this is going to sound counter to like what I just said, but I've got a story. So <laughs> I've always got a story. Sometimes with, at least especially with grandparents, um, oftentimes you'll see that they keep a lot of stuff written down in notes, especially as they get older and start losing their memory. It's not necessarily a bad idea to say, OK, write this down in a notebook, right? Now, is it safe, like totally secure to write it down in a notebook? Maybe not. What's my risk, right? And the risk is that I lose a notebook, right? Well, what's the risk of that? Well, I, the only way I could lose that notebook is if somebody broke into the home, knew where the notebook was, and then took the notebook, and now they have all the passwords, right? So that risk, I think, based on the situation, becomes less and less secure. If you're in a business and you had a desk, and it, I would never tell you to write down your passwords in a notebook. Because the concept of password manager for them like flies way over their head, right? But the concept of, but an Excel file I think is almost worse because they're the ones that click on like links and stuff like that. So there's a widow in my neighborhood, my neighbor called, story, story time. My neighbor called and there's a widow in my neighborhood and she called and said, man, my computer's acting up. And I went down and I'm allergic to cats. And, like she had cats and took like, three allergy pills to go work on her computer. And finally said, what did you do? And she goes, well, I found this photo. I was paid for. It's like a musician I'm really you know, excited about. And so I downloaded it. And she downloaded malware. 
And so that means that now that you have malware, anything that's on our computer can be accessed, but on our notebook, no, right? So I said, well, don't do that ever again, cleaned it up, locked it down, and then she called me like two weeks later saying, man, my computer has malware again, what's going on? So I went back to her house and said, what happened? She goes, well, I couldn't download some of the photos because of whatever you did, so I had my nephew come over and he undid all of the security I put in on her computer and I just shook my head and walked away, right? And I'm like, I did that because you got malware on your computer and it was still in all your information, right? And so part of it is, is that we have to, unfortunately with like our older families, do what we can to make them secure and in some cases, it's here's a notebook, keep it in a safe spot and write down your passwords there. So that's a good question. Like it's kind of counter to what I always preach, but in that that's the scenario I'd probably recommend somebody use a notebook. So other questions? This was fun. Yeah, question. Yeah, so big thing is like Arlo's, make sure that like the firmware and software is updated and that you're using passwords and then change the defaults, right? That's pretty common. The other thing, especially with the Arlo's or some of these that are meant to be, work from home, is I'd actually set up a VPN that will actually let me reach into the network instead of exposing those IPs publicly on the internet that anybody can reach. Um, we've seen situations, and I'll kind of throw this out, um, and I'll give an example of Utah, right? I was talking to some folks at the state and stuff like that. So we've seen situations where we've had servers, at least at my company, like come online and within 15 minutes are compromised, right? Like the time to compromise if you have like an insecure configuration is so short these days that you almost don't have time to recognize that you've been compromised unless you have like, like a full blown like security monitoring and alerting program and you're popped. But if you set up like a secure VPN, the only thing you have to secure is that VPN and making sure that only the right people have access to it. And then you can do whatever you want inside your network and not give yourself unnecessary exposure. When the Olympics came to Utah in 2002, they saw the accounts as far as probes, especially in the state of Utah, like quadruple. It went up like 40% of the people who were probing IPs within Utah to try and find like vulnerable servers and stuff like that. And we see that increase like year over year. Like, we don't even care now, at least in our company, of people who in-map or scan us, like, who cares? Because it happens so often that, like, it's just something that happens. Like, in 1998, you get arrested for that. In 2023, 2024, I don't care. What I do care about is if you can scan and then, like, break into something, right? And that's kind of what I look for. So that's a good question. I don't know if that answers it, so. Other questions? I get the, like my flag saying I'm out of time. Thank you so much. This is fun.